Well, if you would take your Bibles and turn to Zephaniah. I appreciate Don preaching and serving us that way last week. As Jan and I had the opportunity to see our moms and a few other family members, and it was a blessing for sure. So thank you for that. As you make your way to Zephaniah, let me remind you of a couple of things in relation. So uh, just prior, if you remember, is Habakkuk, and Habakkuk actually deals with a, about a 30-year period just after Zephaniah. So Zephaniah acts a bit as a prequel to Habakkuk. So whereas Zephaniah, the Assyrian invasion had already, I mean, with Habakkuk, the Assyrian invasion had already occurred and the Babylonian invasion was about to happen. And of course, again, remember the Northern Kingdom was taken captive and decimated by Assyria. In the second invasion, uh, Babylon took basically whoever remained there as well as the Southern Kingdom in Judah. And that's essentially in the way that God regathers his people is in captivity, similar to what we see in Exodus and in Egypt. There's so many parallels with basically what ends up being um, almost Exodus 2.0 with this period of time in the life of the children of Israel. And in the course of it, Zephaniah is actually here as a prequel leading up to seeing Assyria as what's coming. Now, again, what we see is some of the themes that occur through all of the minor prophets is this. There is a mix of comfort and dismay. Most often what you see is a lot of dismay with comfort coming in at the 11th hour of the text. Uh, Hope will be the last word, the final word that's given. But most often that hope is in a future that may not, probably will not be realized by those who are actually even hearing the message. So we have to look and understand that judgments happen in real historic time, but they only look forward to what will be final when Christ returns and exacts his judgment and justice on all mankind for all of time, and that will be final. So we're still waiting on that one. We also see in time historic deliverances. We see where God is merciful to his own, always has a remnant, always delivers them, but it's just a foretaste. Because what we see is one day there will be a full and final escape as Second Peter chapter 1 speaks of that we have escaped the world of corruption. That will happen one day, not just in a kind of a spiritual and metaphoric sense, but in an actual sense where faith will give way to sight. So during the reign of Josiah, as Zephaniah is, is giving his proclamation, remember this, that Josiah at this time, and this is not too far from the time that Isaiah had written as well, that what we see is Josiah, as they were restoring the temple, which is one of the first things that anybody does when they are restored back to the land, okay, back to Jerusalem. As he's restoring and renovating the temple, they discover the five books of the law. They discover the Torah and discover and rediscover practices that had been neglected for generations. And so this is known as Josiah's reforms. Hezekiah was also part of this. Hezekiah would have been a general and a civic leader in the southern kingdom. In fact, he was very instrumental in staving off the Assyrian invasion that had come against the northern kingdom and certainly was knocking at the door of the southern kingdom, but that was not God's timing yet. So as Zephaniah then will speak of the day of the Lord, I want you to understand that the day of the Lord always represents two things. There's an historic time. So basically when Assyria comes, there's a day of the Lord in a sense, kind of small d, although I'm sure it didn't feel that way at the time. Also with any of the other minor prophets that we see, Assyria or relating to Babylon or eventually even Persia, even though that provides for their deliverance, there is basically at that day of the Lord this, there's a conquering of the enemies of God. So for instance, when Babylon comes in in that second wave, they first are conquering Assyria. Okay, that's the thumbs up part because they were the enemies in the first invasion. Good, finally, they are getting theirs. Except the horses keep coming and they end up coming to the southern kingdom and they also then are both disciplined and also then captured and basically put into slavery. 
That's the thumbs down part uh, when it comes to what's understood. In fact, the prophets, as they are giving their charge, they have this twofold expression of this idea that God is absolutely coming against the nations that have come against my children. But he also comes against his children because his standard of holiness is never, ever superseded or circumvented by ethnicity, ever. God's holy standard is to be met by any and all that would ever call him Lord. Whether they take the name of Israel or Gazan or Amorite, Edomite, whatever, whoever. In fact, what we're going to see today as we close out this text is Zephaniah giving prophecy of what essentially redefines the people of God to include in the future all nations. It would have been a very disruptive message, especially in light of this. Part of what was so difficult for the children of Israel to understand as the prophets were prophesying, they could totally get him prophesying against the foreign nations and the enemies of God. But what they didn't really understand or grasp necessarily was why God would allow them to go through such difficulty or even be subject to captivity by such pagan nations. It's because they misunderstood what it meant to be the chosen people. And so God is, through the prophets, not redefining, clarifying what has always been meant to be a covenant member of God's people. You have to keep that end of the bargain. Of course, what's proven throughout time is that as human beings, whether Israel or Gentile, we just don't. We cannot keep our end of the bargain. God perfectly does, which is certainly why this all ends up pointing to Jesus Christ, because Christ is the only one who's able to keep the covenant. And for any that have faith from any nation are then made part of the kingdom of God if you trust in Christ alone to have performed and kept promises of God's covenant in your place and even dying in your place, admitting that you deserve such a thing, but then also acknowledging that he is alive. Therefore, there's no more sacrifice needed. There's no more priest needed. There's no more go-between needed. All of this points to Christ who will make for himself a people from all the nations. So our question that really governs our message on a most practical level is this, you know, how can we rejoice, which actually that's where this book ends. It ends in a song of rejoicing. How can we rejoice when everything around us hurts so much? How? How can we be thankful? How can we be people of joy when the circumstances do not foster that? Well, what we looked at in the first two and a half chapters is simply this. Well, we can be thankful because God is the God of judgment, that God's justice is going to work out. Part of what can cause us to have our joy robbed is seeing the wicked flourish. And one day we know that God's justice will be perfectly enacted on all flesh everywhere. But that wouldn't be enough because there is that thumbs down part. We are also those that God will come against unless we understand something. He is not just the God of judgment, but he is the God of salvation. See, God does not come in judgment without providing in mercy for those who will believe in him a way of salvation. But even that way is not going to be, there's no way that a human effort could overcome divine judgment. Only divine salvation, divine mercy can help us and cause us to, be, to escape from divine judgment, which is deserved. So as we look at chapter 3, starting in verse 9, here's what the prophet says. For at that time, I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech, that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. From beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshipers, the daughter of my dispersed ones, shall bring my offering. On that day, you shall not be put to shame because of the deeds uh, by which you have rebelled against me. For then I will remove from your midst your proudly exultant ones, and you shall no longer be haughty. 
in my holy mountain, but I will leave in your midst a people humble and lowly. They shall seek refuge in the name of the Lord. Those who are left in Israel, they shall do no injustice and speak no lies, nor shall there be found in their mouth a deceitful tongue, for they shall graze and lie down and none shall make them afraid. Using shepherding language there. But then look in verse 14. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. On that day, it shall be said to Jerusalem, fear not, O Zion, for uh, let not your hands grow weak. The Lord, your God, is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. I will gather those of you who mourn for the festival so that you will no longer suffer reproach. Behold, at that time, I will deal with all your oppressors and I will save the lame and gather the outcasts and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you in at the time when I gather you together, for I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. Now, time's not really going to allow us to take so many of the parallels that run with this language and what Christ does. But basically, if you think about Christ's initial ministry and what he does in showing that he is the king of Israel, what does he do? He heals the lame. So as the prophet says, this is how it's going to start, that there will be, the lame will be healed. And he speaks of these flocks, for instance, these, these that will grace That this isn't just Lord's prayer stuff. This is actually him doing the work of shepherding. But as we would know in John chapter 10, that he shepherds those and seeks after those who are of another fold. Referring to the Gentiles that are also though part of the flock. Uh, Cormac McCarthy is one of my favorite uh, just literature authors. Uh, His Uh, The most frustrating thing about his writing is that he generally doesn't use quotation marks when the characters are having a conversation. Um, But actually, as a pastor, I find some relief in that for some reason. I don't know why, but there's just never an end between what is actually being said and then what's being described. But in his book, The Road, which is probably definitely my favorite. I mean, it's dark. It's difficult to read. It's dystopian. It's post-apocalyptic. It's, I mean, there's just, you're not going to find a flower uh, in the book or uh, really in the film either. A father and his son are traversing this barren and dangerous landscape, and they are basically just trying to figure out a way to survive because of some things that have occurred that have led to these tragic and apocalyptic events. One of the things that occurs in the midst of it is that the father, and it really is down to the father and the son, and they face a lot of they face a lot of, of death and carnage along the way. But one of the things that the father teaches the son is to ask a question of anyone they ever meet. Do you carry the fire? Do you carry the fire? And really what that means is, is that what they were seeing is that in the midst of the bleakness, in the midst of the lack of hope, that people were basically turning towards a more animalistic kind of approach just eat and live or whatever, no matter. And there was no moral guideline. And that was part of the question that he was trying to teach his son is, do you carry the fire? Is there some hope of your humanity of what is light in the future in the midst of this bleakness? Now, I'm not going to give away anything if you ever choose to either read it or, or watch it. Again, I'm not endorsing it. It is very difficult. It's very rough, but I just find it to be Uh, a a bit of an allegory that I think is appropriate for much of what we see going on in our world. But we see much of this kind of thing come through with the minor prophets where there's apocalyptic type stuff going on. I mean, think about it. I mean, you know, in our day and age, you know, to go through something like um, the pandemic and COVID, uh, I mean, you could see how quickly certain things could change. And it really, it was almost like a little bit of a a social earthquake. You didn't realize how fast 
something could become unstable under your feet. We've certainly seen it in political spheres where there's been such a shaking under our feet of what seemed to be such a solid system that it can be disrupted and it can even cause anxiety on the parts of many because it again seems like something that's not as certain as we thought. Certainly, the children of Israel believe that both Jerusalem, the land, other things were secure and stable. And yet, there were enemies that would come in and ravage them. It literally felt like the end of the world. So when Zephaniah comes in and gives this last word of hope, he first of all says this, that to know that God is the God of salvation is to know this, that God is going to save a remnant. There is going to be a remnant There are going to be those. Now, before we get back into verse 9, I want you to look back at verse 8. He says, the Lord says, therefore, wait for me for the day when I rise up to seize the prey for my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour upon them my indignation, all my burning anger for in the fire of my jealousy, all the earth will be consumed. There's not an inch of the planet that we dwell on or the time period of our planet that will go untouched or unseen by the holy God. And really what that reminds us of, and I think the minor prophets remind us of this, is there is no neutrality if you genuinely look at God Almighty. There would either be trembling and fear or there should be song and rejoicing. Because you cannot see that God is perfect, pure, holy, and true, knowing that he will judge everything that is false and sinful. And if you are then removed from that judgment because of what he has shown you in his mercy through his provided king of Israel, who is Jesus, and to know that he has borne that judgment in your place on the cross, there's no way that doesn't produce in us a song. There's no way that doesn't produce in us a sense of joy. There is no way for the redeemed to look upon God as he is and walk away meh. Meh. There's no way. And this is why the word of God has to be before us all the time. We forget. We drift back into self-righteousness. We drift back into, we wouldn't say it out loud, but, you know, kind of like, I, it kind of makes sense that I got saved. I mean, I grew up like this and I grew up like that and I was kind of moral. It just kind of makes sense that I'm a Christian. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. No more than it would make sense to walk into a funeral home and to see someone rise from the dead. That doesn't make sense. There will be, though, a saved remnant. And his description here is telling of what it means. He says in verse 9, For at that time I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech. He's not saying they're going to stop cussing and then they will no longer be cussers. The purity of their speech, much like what you see in Isaiah chapter 6, Behold, I have seen the Lord. I live among a people of unclean lips. I have unclean lips. And then the angel with tongs from the altar brings the coal and applies it to his lips and says, your sin is taken away, your iniquity atoned for. The impurity of speech represents impurity of heart. It's the organ in a sense that expresses the reality of who we are. Now, understanding that the children of Israel and Judah had been actually giving praise and homage to false idols. So in their minds, they're going, hey, we're safe. We're the children of of God. There's nothing that can touch us. But with their lips, which is actually the expression of who they really are, is actually giving praise to falsehood, anti-gods. But he's going to redeem that speech. When he converts them, he's changing a heart and it's going to show is I think the point that he's saying. Now, I think something in this is as he changes their speech from those that give praise to false idols, certainly we see by the end of the book that what is happening is their speech then is turning to praise to God who redeems and delivers. I think in many ways what we start to see here is what we will see at the end time. This is basically, to me, a prophetic turning around of Babel. Where when man in his pride and his arrogance tried to build a temple that would reach to the heavens to show and prove themselves to be godlike, that what God did was struck them with confusion, dispersed them because of confusing them with many languages. 
And here, he is restoring and bringing back together. In fact, you even hear that language of, of this idea of gathering in one accord. And they will all speak the same speech. It will be pure praise to a delivering God. Now, this isn't going to fully occur until the Lord returns and then the Lord establishes his kingdom and his reign. I get that. But understanding it should prompt us, almost like writing prompts, if you ever use that in school or even if you're a writer or anything, you just have some questions or other things that might make you write down some ideas or some thoughts. Almost as a cue for worship prompts leading into eternity, we should reflect this. There should be a unity. Yes, our unity needs to be solely on what our common speech is, which is praise to the God who has delivered us. But at the same time, we should not fear that we desire for that to be a diverse group of people that are singing that same thing because there is something in that single accord, same speech praise that is unique to what we would see in the world and it gives glory to God. This reversal of Babel is how we see that the church is eventually becoming the redefinition of what it means to be the children of God. He says that there will be praise from every tribe, tongue, and nation. This is our hope in doing missions. This is our hope in sharing the gospel with whomever. Because it is all the nations, it is all those from all the nations that God will bring. And they will be part of his remnant because the king of Israel will bring them in and make them one. Even as he said, he will judge all the nations. There will also then be, starting in verse 9, the conversion of those from all the nations. So both are always in effect going on. In Luke chapter 2, 13 and 14, when you hear this declaration of the angels, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace among those with whom he's well pleased. With those is an ethnic leaning term over the whole earth. It's a declaration of this time has come, the Redeemer has arrived. Even Paul, when he speaks in Ephesians and in Galatians of the mystery of the gospel, that mystery is that the Gentiles will be grafted in. Look, make no mistake, you Gentiles, just like almost all of us are, you are not second-class citizens just because you're not a Jewish believer. There's no 1A, 1B. There is one. He even says this, there's no longer a wall of separation between Jew and Gentile. He's not just talking about being at peace and being nice to each other. He is saying he is making a new race. He is creating for himself a new people. And it will not be defined by ethnicity. It will only be defined by the one who has redeemed them. And that's part of the purity of their speech. You are the Lord my and whoever utters that speech, whoever by the Spirit's empowerment says that Christ is Lord. From any background, this is the hope of the gospel. It is both wide open and it is also incredibly narrow and exclusive. Anyone from any ethnic group anywhere, if they hear the gospel and respond, they can come in. They have to go through no gauntlet, which is another reason why, church, we need to be careful that we don't require people to be American or Western before they become Christian or that it's part and parcel. We have to make sure that as we declare these things to all, that we are understanding very clearly that it's also a very narrow statement because even though it says anyone from anywhere can come, Anyone from anywhere that does come has to come through Christ. There is no other way. This king of Israel that Zephaniah is prophesying about is the one who will bring in those from every fold. What he's going to do, according to this text in verses 11, he's going to remove their shame. He's going to restore their humility. In verse 11, it says, On that day you shall not be put to shame. But why? He says, Because the deeds by which you have rebelled against me, for then I will remove from your midst your proudly exultant ones. Guys, he is at this point speaking still of Jerusalem. 
Yes, he's, he's also coming against and saying that there is hope for Jerusalem and for the nations. But what he's saying here is that there are those in Jerusalem who will be removed. Look, I will say boldly, not every Jew is going to be in heaven just because they're Jewish. No more than anybody who loved their mama really well or prayed a prayer one day is going to be in heaven just because they did those things. It's only those who profess faith. There will be those who are arrogant, even within the ethnic children of God, so to speak, who will be removed and not part of the remnant. He says, I'm removing those. You shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain, but I will leave in your midst a people humble and lowly. They shall seek refuge in the name of the Lord. These are people who bear fruit of being God's own. Again, this is not a redefinition as far as uh, it's changed. He's clarifying and in a sense redefining according to their understanding that those who are truly the remnant, those who are truly the children of God bear evidence. They bear evidence and fruit of repentance that they have trusted in God and God alone to deliver them. Not in their background, not in their birthplace, not in any other means They only trust in the God who delivers. And he says the fruit of that will be clear. He says, as I leave these who are humble and lowly, that they will seek refuge in the name of the Lord. Those who are left in Israel, they shall do no injustice. They shall speak no lies. He's already said this about himself earlier in chapter three, that he is the God who does no injustice. He is the God who speaks no lies. They're gonna reflect his character. And I'm I'm just telling you that not just from this kind of more cosmic or global sense of what it means to be a child of God. Let me just simply say this. Certainly salvation is not by works. But if you claim, if you claim to be a child of God and bear no evidence of repentance, no evidence of humility before the God of your salvation, you are deceiving yourself. I don't care where your backside is sitting every Sunday morning. I don't care what you're watching online every Sunday morning. If the evidence of your life, the speech that comes out of your mouth, the reliance of your heart upon whatever else, if it is not bearing evidence of one who is solely dependent on the God who saves, you are deceiving yourself. As he removes this shame and restores humility, we see that as these, this remnant is now marked by repentance, 1 John 2, 3 says, and by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. But it's not just this activity of not being prideful, of being but humble. And, and also with that, making sure that we're not speaking lies, it's also those who eventually give praise. What you give praise, what you praise with your lips is telling of the affections of your heart. So you have to ask yourself, what do you spend your time mumbling or saying, whether you're talking to yourself in your recliner, armchair, whatever, whether it's quarterback for actual football or politics or whatever, what gets you the most angry? Sometimes that's the idol that you are defending. What is it that comes to your lips most often? That will reveal the affection of your heart. Because what he says here at the end is that these are people who will be given to praise. The saved remnant sings. In verse 14, he says, Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with your heart. O daughter of Zion, or daughter of Jerusalem, the Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. And make no mistake, as much as these enemies come against you, the scriptures tell us in the New Testament that we by nature are enemies of God. Until we are saved, you are not born Switzerland. You are not born on neutral ground in some DMZ zone where you are going to decide at some point if you're going to be bad or be good. 
That is false. Scripture makes very clear there is none righteous, no, not one. We are born with our inclinations towards sin and self-righteousness. And as soon as we get the chance to say mine, we are expressing the fact that we are sinners also by choice. As soon as we are given speech, our nature comes out of our mouths. We are sinners by nature and choice. We need to become friends of God. And the only way we can do that is for God to make us his friends. God is the only one that can overcome God's judgment so that we are no longer enemies, but children. This joy is is to happen even now. He says, sing aloud. He doesn't say in the future. He says, even now, Assyria is coming from Zephaniah's standpoint. Then Babylon's coming. In the midst of these circumstances, he still says, sing for joy. Sing aloud. Again, how? Why? Because we know that God remains God regardless of the circumstances. Regardless if it looks like those who are against God flourish. We know that God will exact his justice at some point. But we also know that God saves his own. And even though we may not see it in this world, even on our worst day, so to speak, that also for the believer becomes the best day. Because it's a translation out of this life and into a life of sight with him forever away from the effects of sin. This is why we can live boldly. This is why Angela, even though through tears here on earth, knows that there is great joy awaiting her to go back to where where she is called to live this out. Because no matter what is possible about the future, unknown to all. She knows that she is doing and proclaiming the goodness of God. She knows that even on her worst day, so to speak, it will be her best day. This is in light of the fact that he is God now. He is God in judgment even now. He is God in salvation even now. He can save any and all at any time from any nation. This is why we must proclaim the gospel to every, to all flesh. He says that with this, that the Lord, in verse 17, the Lord your God is in your midst. Now, now, another reason why we sing aloud even now as a remnant who are awaiting his return, but we're not just waiting, sitting on our hands. We're waiting, still singing, still praising, still declaring the deliverance of God. And yes, when we have opportunity, his justice, but he will rejoice over us with gladness. He will quiet us by his love. He literally brings a calm to the disruptive circumstances of the day when you reflect on God's love for you. I'm not saying there's not clinical anxieties that maybe we need to go to a doctor for and even take some medications to knock the edge off. But I will say that no matter what edge is knocked off, we still have a responsibility to not be anxious. And the only real path to that is reflecting on who God is and who you are in light of God. And if you know that he has shown his love for you and that you are saved, it will quiet you no matter what the circumstances. It's part of his path for worship. In fact, there's, no, there's, there's sometimes where worship in a sense is a battle cry, but it's not a battle cry against all the enemies out there. It's a battle cry against the enemy of our flesh, our self-doubt, our self-hatred. It's a battle cry against ourselves who forget that we have been redeemed by God's sheer love. This future hope starts in verse 18. He says, I will gather those of you who mourn for the festival so that you will no longer suffer reproach. See, as he's brought together his own, he sees here, in fact, I think the best best, uh, reflection of this is in Revelation 22, 20 and 21. He who testifies to these things says, surely I'm coming soon. Amen. Come Lord Jesus, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Or as the text more so means, all the saints And all the saints are from all the nations. In fact, just before we close, I want to share this out of John because I want you to just make this connection. In John chapter 10, verse 16, here's what he says. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd, For this is the reason the Father loves me, because I lay my my life down, that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. 
I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my father. Jesus literally dies to bring and make for himself a singular people from all the tribes, tongues, and nations. Over in the next chapter, in John chapter 11, verse 50, here's what he says. Nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. Now, when he's saying this, he's actually, this is about the plot to kill Christ. And there's actually this, uh, Caiaphas is actually making this statement. But he says, this is what, this is John. I mean, this is so John because this is John commenting on what has been said historically. He says, he did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation and not for the nation only, but also together into one, the children of God who are scattered abroad. See, if you, if you want to look at this from a particular angle and squint and turn your head just enough, you'll think, oh, well, what he means is Jews from all the other nations. That's not what he's saying, nor is that consistent with what Scripture says. He's saying those that he's going to redeem actually are coming from all nations to himself, to this new nation, this new city that he will make for himself that will be inhabited by all of the redeemed from all of the nations from all of time. Paul gives us some clarity of this, as I mentioned earlier, but over in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There's neither male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Do you hear that? This is Genesis 12, 5 promise to Abram that he will be a blessing to all the nations. And he says that it's not, there's no Jew, no Greek. These are all one because of Christ. And he says, and then if you're in Christ, it's almost like the, the holy gospel Pythagorean theorem. If you're this and you're this, then you're this. No matter what you are historically, no matter what you are in your gender or in your ethnicity, if you proclaim and declare Christ, then you are his. And if you are one of his, then you're part of the promise that God made to Abram. God's really, really good at keeping his promises. <coughs> and then over... <coughs> I'm not as choked up as it sounds. Ephesians 2, 14. <clears throat> For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility <clears throat> by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of two. So making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, <clears throat> thereby killing the hostility. This is the God that Zephaniah is prophesying about. That there is redemption, there is restoration. And it's afforded to all the nations. And one day, even though they are going through it, man, they are going through Assyria and then Babylon is coming. And at one moment, they might get word of Babylon falling to Persia and they might rejoice <clears throat> only to know, oh, it's going to be a long journey to get back to Jerusalem, but it will happen. Isaiah even prophesies about Cyrus, the leader of Persia, releasing them back to the land. But it's a long journey. And guess what? It doesn't last. They grow weary once they're back in Jerusalem about 20 years later after they've started to practice some things again and after they've built up some walls, they go back to their old practices of mingling with other nations as far as, and it's not about mixed marriages, it's about these are false God nations. These are, they're intermarrying with those who actually are worshiping idols because it seems like a path that affords prosperity. They do the same thing again. So even that restoration back to physical Jerusalem was only temporary because of what will happen in the future one day for all that call upon the name of Christ. And that holy Jerusalem will be big enough for every tribe, tongue, and nation that has ever declared that Jesus Christ is Lord. 
So Christian, I would say this, you can be thankful right now because God is still God. Regardless of what you see going on with evil, regardless of what you feel or experience yourself, God remains God in all circumstances and you are still commanded to rejoice now. But if you're not one who's following God, if you're not a child of God, or at least know that for a fact, I implore you to listen to the prophecies of Zephaniah as revealed and then fulfilled in the New Testament through Jesus Christ, that the only way for you to escape being an enemy of God and to become a friend of God is by believing that God can do that. And that he did do that by Jesus Christ being the one who took the penalty for being an enemy, dying on the cross, but that he rose from the dead. There's nothing you can bring to the table except one who receives the gift of salvation by his grace. But you're not always going to have that opportunity. And that's not meant to scare you. It's just a reality. We don't know what the future holds. So Christian, be faithful But if you're not a Christian, I would implore you, be urgent. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Do not resist his call on your life. Let's pray. Our God, we thank you that you have revealed yourself in your word over and over and over again to be consistent, to be one who has made promises and then kept them to be one who is consistent in your holiness and the judgment that is then expressed for all flesh, no matter what their ethnic background. And yet, no matter what our ethnic background, you've also offered salvation for any who would call upon the name of Christ, believing that Jesus died for our sin, personally, specifically, paid that debt, And that we trust that he's also been raised from the dead so that there is nothing else to add and there's no one else that could step in and even help. That it is enough. That Jesus Christ is enough. And God, for us, the best way for us to discern if we are part of your kingdom or if we feel like we know that we are but we're just in a bad spot right now, we need to reflect on what's coming across our lips. Is it complaint and revile, reviling? Is it murmuring and disputing? Or regardless of the circumstance, are we still prone to praise, to exalt the God who could wipe us out yet has shown his love and his mercy to deliver? Lord, increasingly make us a people that sing in light of your love and increasingly cause the lost world right around us to see that and to wonder and that we would always be ready, whether in a pulpit, in a pew, or just across a fence, to be able to make a defense for why we can rejoice in the midst of a difficult world because of Christ and what he has done for us and what he will do when he comes. We pray this in your name. We trust you. And may we worship you even now. Amen.